Hi there, this is Adrian Cockcroft, I'm VP Cloud Architecture Strategy at AWS. And thanks very much for inviting me to be a keynote here at the Ray Summit. I've been following Ray for a little while, it's interesting technology. But I'm gonna be talking today about serverless uh, in particular as a one of the patterns that's emerging in modern application development. And towards the end, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that might relate to Ray. Let's start off by looking at some sort of motivational stories for how we got here. How long does it really take to build a new application from scratch? And one of the experiences I have here is to think about hackathons. These are really time bounded. And at AWS reInvent the last few years, we've had a nonprofit hackathon for social good. We've formed teams of about four people. They turn up on Monday at 8 a.m. with no idea what they're going to be working on. We bring in some nonprofits. The nonprofits explain a set of problems they have, and the teams then pick a problem. They're assigned to a nonprofit, and they have 12 hours to build something that helps that nonprofit. It's an incredibly tightly bounded situation. Quite often, the members of the teams, they have different backgrounds, experiences. A lot of them have never worked together or even met before. Where would you start? How much do you think you could build in one day? So back in 2016, I had kind of a light bulb moment because I was a judge at one of these. And what we saw, and this was pretty early days, this is almost four years ago, and, and the whole AWS Lambda environment was pretty nascent at the time. But every team used Lambda. And in, in less than a day, even though it was for many of the team members the first time they'd used it, they built extremely functional and scalable prototypes. The The... The nonprofits which, and the judges were just blown away with what was built that day. Uh, it was a you know, absolutely sort of uh, you know, critical. It like really let me understand what was different. There was something different happening here. And so, obviously, the plural of anecdote is not data. But I, I would go around giving the various talks I was giving, and I would say, "Well, this is my experience. What else? What other experiences do people have?" And people started sharing stories with me. And I'm gonna run through one of these stories and I have quite a few of these, but I'm just gonna pick one of them. I'll call this the conventional development disaster. There were 20 people, they had a nine month long project. They'd been working on it for seven months and they, was no, they were nowhere near having a finished, finished system. They were way behind and they were making very poor progress. The guy I was talking to said, well, him and another guy were Friday lunchtime were sort of taking their lunch break and being grumpy about that there was no progress going on. And then one of them said, you know what, I think we could rewrite this in Lambda really quickly. And I said, yeah, sure, that sounds plausible. What are you doing this weekend? And they basically said, well, I can clear my decks this weekend. You know, family's out of town, I've got some time. So they actually just went home that afternoon and started coding and did one of those all night things where they worked right through, right through Sunday. And they got to sort of Monday morning, they finished it, and they'd actually completed the entire functionality of the whole project. So that was, that was interesting. So they, then they went into work and they started discussing with everyone else. And it took about a month for the rest of the team to agree that they had actually built all the functionality and that the security and all of these things, basically it took them a month to persuade people to let them deploy the thing they had built that weekend and they put it out there. Now, obviously, you know, don't advocate working through weekends like this, but this is probably a week or two, a man week or a man two, you know, person week or two's worth of effort in, on a normal cycle. And obviously some of those months of development were in terms of like getting the spec right and knowing what to build but it was the execution. Once they knew what to build, it was just taking them too long to get it built. So let's just look at why is it so fast to write a serverless app? And I'm gonna use a bit of an analogy here. Let's say we want to build a model spaceship that looks suspiciously like one you might've seen in a movie. We want to build it quickly and cheaply. So the traditional way you do this is you design a prototype, an AutoCAD or something, you'd carve a model in clay or, or, or you know, get, get a system built. You use that to make molds. You produce injection molded parts. 
you assemble the parts, you find they don't fit, you go back and you reassemble a few parts and you reduce some more and you go back and forth a few times. And then finally, you've got your toy, you can sell it. And this is kind of the flow you'll be looking at. And it's sort of roughly analogous to a typical custom design software flow. You're going through all these different stages before you get your finished product. So that's what I call traditional development. What do I mean by rapid development? A big bag of blocks, a set of instructions, and really a few hours. And you can build the Lego version of that spaceship. All right now, if you think about the Lego version, it really lacks fine detail. It's got sharp corners. It's recognizable. It's not exactly what was asked for, but the, your kid's still going to play with it. It's much easier to modify and extend. So if you want to, you can add piece, bits and pieces to it in a way that is much harder to do with the, uh, the full custom design. And the other thing is that you look at this and you say, well, this group of Lego bricks just isn't pointy enough. I need to optimize it and I'm gonna form a new custom brick. And if you look at what Lego have done over the years, there are now tens of thousands of, di of different Lego designs. And a lot of those are those additional bricks over the standard ones are uh, these custom pieces, you know, little figurines and uh, pointy nose cones for rockets and things. But what you're doing here is you're post optimizing by building a more specialized common component, which you're going to reuse somewhere else. So if we look at this in terms of development, we're moving from full custom design to these building blocks assembly from months of work to hours of work. Moving from custom components, they're hard to integrate, standard components like Lego bricks, very easy to understand the interfaces, they're interoperable. You move from having too many detailed choices and very long decision cycles to this need to adjust requirements to fit the patterns available. Like if you think about a toy built out of Lego bricks, you can't make it 5% bigger or smaller, right? It's, it's going to be this big. And the next possible way you could build something that shape is you know, twice as big or something like that. There's, you, you're quantizing your solution space and you have to use the constraints to speed up decisions, but you have to also relax your requirements to fit the quantization of the components that are available. And that's really the, the main thing that you have to kind of work on is trying to say, well, if we just relax this requirement, we could build this in days instead of months, that kind of thing. So looking at this as sort of the difference between custom built container-based solutions and the serverless model, instead of having all these choices of frameworks and API mechanisms, there are very standardized choices, standardized choices in serverless. You combine together a bunch of building blocks you get something put together, and then you look at that and say, well, these are the bits where it wasn't really working for us. We had to solve for some things that serverless doesn't do well yet. And of course, we look at those solutions and we say, well, okay, we can solve for that piece. So we're adding solutions to, to AWS Lambda in particular to reduce the number of cases you have where it doesn't work for you yet. So this is this big question. So why doesn't everyone use serverless first? And there's a very long version of this talk where I go through every single objection and limitation that I could think of. And you should also look at some of these reInvent talks. I've, I've listed references to them down at the bottom. You can just Google that code and or look it up on YouTube, you'll find it. So this is sort of general categories of the kinds of objections that I see you know, the patterns, uh, portability, um, language support, we support all the languages now and you can bring your own language. Um, scalability and resilience is they're all there. We have very good startup and network startup latency nowadays and it's reducing over time. We've got good interfaces to databases, uh, proxy gateways and ways to limit that. Uh, we've got lots of get ways to get you started, new security models. Uh, we're handling, uh, there's lots of very good state handling and event processing mechanisms now and uh, we've increased the run duration. And also we've got a, a lot of tooling for supporting complex configurations. So all of these different areas, there's solutions. There's a version of this talk I gave at the serverless first function in May. You can go find that uh, if, you, if you hunt around uh, and see a video of me giving the longer version of this talk. So I'm gonna pick on a few of these. When you talk to Lambda, you have a function and it's deployed on a, on a core of a machine and by default, 
um, you have thousands of these. 3,000 is the default limit. So you have up to 3,000 calls available just in case that's the, that number of requests come in at the same time. That limit can be increased to tens of thousands. You know, we're sort of pushing up into getting close to 100,000 for some customers for some sort of flash sale workloads. So this is a ridiculously large machine that's available to just run you know, a single function, basically, that, or whatever, how many functions you want to run. Another problem we've just solved recently is the per function disk space. And this is particularly relevant to the, um, the deep learning space. A lot of deep learning models end up being quite big. And what one of the limits we had with Lambda was the packaged up lam <clears throat> Lambda function had a maximum disk space of 512 megabytes. So if you have a, say a two gigabyte or a 10 gigabyte uh, model, AI model, um, you couldn't deploy that easily as a Lambda function. What we've now got is EFS support. So that gives you an NFS mounted file system, you know, almost 50 terabytes per file and basically petabytes of space. So now what you can do is deploy your machine learning model to an EFS mount point. Uh, your Lambda function mounts that and, and now it can pull into that model and wander around and import it, whatever it needs to do. Um, and the default is up to 25,000 concurrent connections into that specific EFS file system. So that's, that's a pretty decent sized capacity um, for serving very large amounts of data out via Lambda. So I think that's an that's a interesting capability you might not have run into. We announced that just a few months ago. So if we look, another, another common question is startup latency. We've been reducing startup latency, particularly 99th percentile latency over the years. Uh, things like network initialization, we've solved those problems. But if you think about a Lambda function, it has an initialization phase and then an execution phase. And if you're coding in a language like Go or Python, maybe the initialization phase isn't an issue. This is, particularly in Go, your startup time is so quick that it really doesn't matter. If you're doing stuff in say Java or a system that has a large initialization phase where you want to preload something, say you want to go out to that EFS file system and load the model into memory or load the subset of the model you're interested into memory. You can do that in the initialization phase and that could take you know, tens of seconds, whatever it takes to do. Then your Lambda function is sitting there ready to run waiting for the initial event to come in to be processed to give you say an inference, inference result. You can now pre-initialize these functions, particularly if you know at a certain point in time that you're going to have a lot of incoming requests. Again, flash sales, workloads, uh, things are triggered by uh, external events like uh, TV adverts or uh, time of day things like some, you know, clocking in at 9 a.m., those kinds of uh, events that are time calendar and time triggered. You can say before it happens, you can go and allocate tens of thousands of things functions, have them ready and ready to run. So you, you, work, you don't have all that startup latency. And then after that, shut them all down whenever you're done with it. So very high utilization. Another th uh, common thing with Lambda is a functional programming model. And the whole point of functioning pro functional programming is you don't have state. Well, so people think, well, that means we don't handle state. Well, it turns out we have lots of ways to handle state, in particular with step functions. We have a Lambda-based state machine where these flows can last for a whole year. What I mean by that is, let's say you have a flow where somebody signs up on a website and the sign-up flow involves sending them an email. You have to remind them a few times before they respond to it to confirm their email address. And then you're, you're going back and forth with a human interaction that could last days or weeks. Um, those are the kinds of flows that you can automate with step functions. And there's no utilization in the meantime, like nothing is running until the next thing happens and that triggers a step, that triggers a Lambda function. So this is all a very efficient way of building those business logic flows. And then you get to visualize the business logic and there's pretty sophisticated ways to model the flows in step functions. Uh, it's an, it's a, a consistent model, you get exactly once consumption of, of, uh, of state. And that's, that's a hard thing to get built and to get to work at scale and at speed. 
So based on simple workflow in the back end, which is something that AWS built, actually, I think it may even predate AWS. It was used without, within Amazon. It's one of the Amazon core capabilities, which was externalized uh, like a decade ago. And this WF is all hard to use in its raw form. Simple workflow sits on top of that and gives you a very easy to use mechanism. So you can have thousands of steps per second. Now this, we've had some customers using this for pumping large amounts of data around in their uh, data science systems where they want to run everything through a step. So you can process millions of events, you know, hundreds of millions of events through a, a express workflow to sort of shuffle things through. And that gives you a much lower cost way of, of processing these things. I'm gonna run through quickly um, a, a demo application, the machine learning based application. This was built by Jerry Hargrove. He wanted to recognize aircraft. So he said, let's create a little serverless bot. You tweet a picture of a plane at it and it will try and figure out what kind of plane it is. This should be an A380. So that's fairly simple. So then the question is, well, what if there's more than one plane in the picture and this gets a bit more complicated. So he built a, a more complex solution. And then he eventually built a, a step functions based uh, model for this. And this is, if you can go find his, uh, his GitHub account, there are versions of this uh, uh, available if you want to look at it. And it's out calling SageMaker and, and using Amazon recognition. If SageMaker's building the model, it does a bunch of things, but it's using step functions to build it. So the business logic is in Lambda, the control flows and step functions, the error looping and branching is all handled for you. And I think this is an interesting way to rapidly build and prototype a lot of uh, uh, machine learning based mod, um, applications. Use the AWS CDK, it's using Python to build pretty much the whole thing. And you can see it's you know, classifying aircraft. It's like finding all of the things on the picture that might be planes, trying to read tail numbers, cropping aircraft from the image, that kind of thing. Anyway, I went through a few of these. Um, if, you, if you want to dig in, there's more information on this. Bottom line, I think this is the fastest way to build a modern application. If there's something that isn't working for you, let us know and we'll work on that next. Just a couple of thoughts about Ray. Um, I did ask around a little bit. There are a few people starting to use Ray with serverless applications, but nothing that's public currently that, that I could locate. So certainly interested to hear about that. But I'm interested to see how is it easy to integrate Ray serve with a step functions application? And then what's the best way to run Ray inside a Lambda function? I think these are areas of interest as we sort of move forward with the, uh, with the, the various paradigms here. So thanks, that's what I had and uh, appreciate you listening to me and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.